Hello, everyone, and welcome to the business of Michael Jordan memorabilia. I'm your host, Darren Ravel from the Action Network. And leading up to the big, uh, the last chance, we have a tremendous show for you tonight. We have George Carl, the great coach, who's going to talk about a piece of memorabilia he has, as well as stories from the Sonics 1996 going up against the Bulls and Michael Jordan in the 1996 NBA Finals. We have Cal Ripken Jr. on the show. He has a piece of memorabilia that Michael Jordan gave to him, and we're going to uh, evaluate that and see how much it might be. Uh, we'll talk to him about Michael Jordan as well. Uh, we have Nat Turner, who is one of the biggest collectors of Michael Jordan memorabilia uh, in the world. He has an incredible card collection. He's going to show that to us. And because... Dennis Rodman, as well as Phil Jackson, is the focus of tonight's show on ESPN. Um, we have Darren Prince, who's been the marketing agent of Dennis Rodman for 21 years. Uh, we're also going to be giving away a 1984-85 Bulls yearbook with Orlando Wold Woldridge and uh, Michael Jordan on the cover. Uh, you have to follow the Action Network on Twitter and uh, hashtag MJ Raffle to win it. But uh, I want to introduce our first guest of the evening. Uh, he is George Carl. Uh, of course, he uh, went to North Carolina, like Michael Jordan. Uh, I think he graduated in 73, so seven years before Jordan came. Uh, and of course, uh, went on to coach uh, the Cavs, Warriors, Sonics, Bucks, Nuggets, uh, a tremendous coach, uh, a thousand, more than a thousand wins uh, in his NBA career. So we will, uh, we'll get to George uh, and look at his Team USA uh, jersey. George, are you there? I think he's on, I think he has to unmute himself, right, Ev? There he is. There he is. How are you, George? I can hear you. I am well. Bored, hibernating is getting a little old. Uh, yeah, it is, it is It is a very interesting time. You know, thank God we have uh, this treat that ESPN is giving us, although I think I would have preferred it in consecutive days. Um, stringing me along now 45 days into quarantine isn't exactly what I was hoping for. But um, so you're, you're camped out. You got your North Carolina uh, blue on. Um, so tell me, uh, tell me about uh, your relationship with Michael Jordan. Obviously you were at North Carolina before him. Um, but, but what has your relationship been over time? Obviously as a opposing coach, of course, but also as a alum. Well, I think I met Michael his freshman year and, um, Roy Williams had told me that they thought they had, had found a great player. And uh, I went back there for a football game, I think, before an NBA season. Met him, saw him practice a little bit. Extremely impressed. But, uh, I mean, I, I never thought he'd become the best, in my mind, the best player in the world. And, you know, I think he's done it because of a, a self-motivation that very few people have. He's an athlete. He's very talented. He's very skilled basketball-wise. He can beat you in any way, but there are other guys that have had that skill, those skills. Not a lot of them, but there have been some athletically and physical skills and talent. LeBron, Magic, Bird. You know, some people want to throw Kevin Durant in there. Some people go back a little bit with Oscar Robinson. But Michael's heart and his competitiveness, I've never seen a guy like this guy. I mean, this guy wants to win playing poker, he wants to win playing golf, he wants to win playing ping pong, he wants to look the best in the room. Um, but, you know, we've been blessed in North Carolina to have him, and he's been a great ambassador for the for the university. And, you know, he's come back and played golf with us a few times. The coaches in North Carolina get together and play down in Pinehurst every August. I remember three or four times where Michael made it. And he's, he's, he started out being an above-average golfer, but he's a hell of a golfer now. He can really play. And he's always been a big-time friendly to everybody. 
Uh, he's always done anything the Carolina fraternity wanted him to do. Uh, and I thought, what I liked about the first two episodes is he talked like a Tar Heel. I mean, huh. he talked like he's being directed by Coach Smith. He talked about we and not me. He talked about it's a team game and playing hard is important. Playing together is important. And uh, playing smart is important. Uh, now, what was it like to go up against him? So the 1996 uh, NBA Finals, um, where you caught some slack for saying that you believed your travel on game after game two uh, killed the rest of the, the series, which is interesting because now people talk about sleep and travel as if it's everything. But at the time, people didn't understand going home and then there was a delay right after game two you had to your your plane had to stop over and you you said we basically lost the momentum of the series so tell that tell that story well you know the first two games were fairly competitive uh they all were you know single digit games i think the first game they, they got they made their free throws and made it a 10 point game or something uh but it was a friday night game in chicago and the game got over, whatever, 11 o'clock, got to the airport after 12, and, you know, took off at 12.30, which is 10.30 back in Seattle. It's supposed to be a four-and-a-half to five-hour flight. A snowstorm hit, hit over Montana. We had to stop and get refueled. And to make a short story, we got home in, the, in our beds around 6 o'clock. We played on Sunday at 12.30. So what, the only way we could get a walkthrough or a film session or any type of communication would we had to go in and practice on Saturday. So Chicago was sleeping, resting, probably got on an airplane about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they were well rested, and we had to get up at noon or 2 o'clock uh, to have a practice, a walkthrough, a talk through, a, sh a shoot around. And Couldn't we do it. Flat in game three. If you go back and look at the video, you'll see we came out flat. The only game Michael got off on us was game three. He had a big night. I don't know. I had 30 some. He played really well. And they, they destroyed us. They beat us by 15 or 20 points. After that, whatever our pride and our getting our confidence back, we went a close game in game four, kind of get a, an edge in game five, and we have some momentum. And I think the two things that really hurt us was the travel. The coach made a bad decision. And I didn't, I didn't take the 12.30 Sunday start in the play. I mean, if it was a Sunday night game, I think, I think you could have argued that I have a bunch of BS. But the way it worked out, we came out flat. We were disoriented, uh, unfocused, whatever you want to call it. And they got a 3-0 lead on us. And the other thing we missed was Nate McMillan. You know, Nate McMillan was the glue, our glue guy. He was our guy that made everything go. And when he played in that series, I thought we played even or even better than even uh, with, with Chicago. Now, George, uh, you tweeted at me. You have a really nice piece of memorabilia. Tell the story behind the 1992 signed Dream Team jersey it has all 13 on there including chuck daly uh how'd you get it uh i'm gonna you know i've had cancer three times so i'm an advocate for cancer one of the good one of the fun foundations is it uh, is the dana and david pump foundation in la and david and dana pump have been my friends for i don't know 30 years and it, their father died of cancer and they decided to come and put this event on in, in LA, and it's become a huge event. I mean, it's a big time event now. And uh, that jersey was up for grabs, and Penny Marshall and I got in the bidding war. <laughs> Penny Marshall, a big Laker fan, uh, you know, just a big basketball fan. And we went, I, you know, I was hoping to get it for like 10 or 15,000, and it got over 20,000, but I finally won out. And, uh, you know, now I, I was just 
my, my son and I have collected a lot of memorabilia over the years. He took 90% of that, but all the Michael Jordan stuff or anything North Carolina oriented, I still got. Well, we talked to uh, Ken Golden of Golden Auctions, and he said a lot is going to depend on the jersey itself. So the signatures are worth north of ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 together. But the jersey itself, was it a jersey that was made at the time? Was it a jersey? That, and we'll, we'll obviously have to find out about that. But that like when they're analyzing these memorabilia pieces, they obviously say, OK, the autographs, they look legit. We can say they're legit. But sometimes it even comes down to, well, how, how is this jersey? Is this an authentic champion? We know it's not a game used one because that probably would have gone for three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars dollars $400,000. But that's where the uh, evaluation is here in terms of the jersey, which is kind of funny. You get a jersey with all these signatures and then it comes down to the actual jersey. But I could tell you it's gone up in price over the last week because Michael Jordan memorabilia is absolutely insane right now. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I want to sell it. I'm, everything I own probably has a price. Uh, my, my, my family probably doesn't want me to sell it. You know, my, 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 I have three kids that all probably would love to have it. And uh, so it's always fun to see what they're worth. You know, one of the other, I remember really in my life is I collect Roberto Clemente baseball cards. And I have like 30 of them. And I, someday I'm going to go in and see what they're worth. Awesome. Well, memorabilia is so fun to collect. I know that there are guys that keep everything and guys that keep nothing. Jordan's actually a guy who keeps almost nothing. I was sitting in his office about four years ago and I asked him what the shoe in the shoe box was in the frame. And he said, I don't know. And I was like, well, most people have an office and you, you know, you keep something and you say, well, this is the shoe that I did this in. Um, which is one of the reasons why the flu game shoes, I think, were available. And, you know, because Jordan gave it to collectors, which is really nice in that sense. But he's not like Emmett Smith, who tagged every single touchdown ball. So it's interesting to see how guys collect and, uh, you know, what they are doing while they are in their career. George, uh, I got to run. Uh, we have to do this again. I have like a million more questions for you. Darren, anytime if I can help you out, have some fun. We're kind of bored right now. Let's get it on sometime soon. Uh, and and make sure you check out. Uh, tell us about your podcast. What's the name of it? Truth and Basketball. Truth uh, and Basketball uh, is his podcast, and he's at Coach Carl Twenty Two on Twitter. If you want to follow him, hey, thanks so much, Coach. Appreciate you. Okay, Darren. Have a good night, man. Enjoy it. You got it. All right, so we are uh, 45 minutes until the last dance. Um, uh, so we are um, we have a great show ahead. So if you're just joining, uh, we have Cal Ripken coming on next, who has an awesome piece of Michael Jordan memorabilia. We have Nat Turner, one of the biggest uh, Michael Jordan collectors in the world. Uh, and we have Darren Prince, who is the... Um, uh, agent for 21 years, a marketing agent for Dennis Rodman. We're also giving away a 1984-85 Bulls yearbook, Michael Jordan on it. Uh, please follow us at Action Network HQ on Twitter and uh, hashtag MJRaffle to win it. We'll give it away by the end of the show. Do we have Cal Ripken ready? Not yet. Okay. Uh, so, um, the show, t the, the show on the, the, the last dance, this, this, uh, time around, um, uh, we have Dennis Rodman, which is an unreal story. And we have, uh, Phil Jackson, also a crazy story. So I'm excited to see both of those. <laughs> ah, we got Cal, Cal Ripken Jr. How are you? I'm doing really well. I was uh, sitting here the whole time listening to your wonderful interview with uh, George. Yeah, he. I had a lot of questions for him. Unfortunately, like we make this an hour, and that's what it is. But uh, yeah, it's 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 pretty amazing uh, just to hear from him and his North Carolina connections, and obviously going up against Jordan and having to coach that. Um, I just came off saying, you know, there are players who keep their memorabilia. Where were you during your career? Did you like? keep every bat and keep every glove and keep every everything or 
Were you in the middle or were you like, no, I, I don't want any of this? I don't want places or traffic because Whoa. I don't have a map. That's my uh, TV going off right now. Okay, sorry about that. Oh, good. <laughs> well, uh, I am someone that uh, has kept everything that, uh, that I ever had. Um, it's silly stuff that uh, um, I didn't throw anything out. I'm a pack rat. I wasn't a collector across the league, but there were times when you would exchange your stuff from someone else's stuff. Um, or you'd find yourself in a unique position to, to get a gift or something. So I have some other people's um, memorabilia, like these shoes here, uh, for example. But uh, I kept everything. Um, um, I'm starting to go through now. I'm going through some stuff and I'm having some fun time remembering, you know, what all that stuff means. And, uh, and I'm starting to organize a little bit to kind of see what I have. But I have, I have everything. Yeah, it's, it's amazing because, you know, I was – uh, in, in 1987, 88, that's really when I started collecting and players really weren't aware of anything. Yes, you gave your autograph, but really I think, and, and I'm sure you agree with me, people started showing up to hotels and those graphers in like 92, 93. And that's where the collect. So, so pretty much for the first 12 years of your career, there really wasn't awareness by the players or the fans, you know, that things were really collectible. No, but I, I always had a sort of an ownership, a territorial feeling of my stuff. Um, you know, I see every once in a while that there's a game use glove of mine on uh, that's being sold, but there's only one glove that's unaccountable for in uh, that's I, that I wore in my games, um, and uh, that got stolen in between uh, Seattle and Minnesota. I think uh, it came out of my bag where I didn't have a lock on my bag, and somebody reached in there and grabbed it. I guess. That's the only one that's unaccountable for. So I have all my gloves, all my game gloves, including the one. Uh, I wish I wish I would have thought about this before I came on. Um, President Reagan threw out the first pitch in 1984. He was uh, we won the World Series in '83. We opened with Chicago. I had a home run on my first at bat. He was still in the dugout, and I had given him my backup game glove to, to use as a throwout uh, to throw out the first pitch. And he gave my, the glove back to me after the. Sir, I'd, I'd appreciate it if you keep it. And I said, no, I can't keep it. I said, well, if you give it back to me, you have to sign it. So he took ah. out and signed Ronald Reagan on my uh, glove, which uh, I have a bunch of pictures there. But that, uh, that's one of my prized possessions. Let's uh, talk about this, uh, these shoes that you have. Mm -hmm. what's, the, uh, what's the story? I think they're Barcelona 7 Air Jordans. So what's the uh, – what it's, it's signed. Is it used? Uh, it's, it's game used, yeah. We, uh, I'll tell you the context and the history behind it. Uh, baseball came together, you know, for umpire John Hirschbeck. There was a fundraiser yep. for John Hirschbeck in Chicago. I'm thinking uh, uh, memory served. I talked to Tony LaRusso about this re fairly recent March 90, 93, I think. 93, yeah, it would be 93. Uh, so yep. we, uh, we all went up there, and uh, during that process of, uh, of the fundraiser, um, a number of us went to the Chicago Bulls game that night. And so after the game, we went into the clubhouse and talked to Michael for a minute. And uh, he took his shoes off his feet and gave them to the cause. So I took him, took him back for the cause. And then I ended up buying them, similar how George ended up uh, buying it. Penny Marshall did not bet against uh, or bid against me. <laughs> but I thought it was a really good way. Um, I saw the game. I like Michael. Um, so I uh, put my money up and uh, I ended up with the shoes. And uh um, I enjoy him just, just from thinking about, uh, you know, being there, watching him. And uh, um, so it makes me feel good just to have him. So we, uh, we reached out to Ken Golden of Golden Auctions. Um, they sell probably the most game-used Jordan stuff. Uh, he said they're worth at least $75,000. And with a uh, letter from you, it's probably worth more. Uh, what's in, what's interesting about Michael Jordan's shoes is that the first three or four uh, Jordans pretty much disintegrate. I mean, the foam on the bottom of it is so bad that all the Air Jordan ones just look like they were thrown in a time capsule in the ground and they just don't survive. So that's actually to have a 92 shoe uh, or 93 shoe is is much better because of the materials. Uh, I got to ask you this question. Um, so I was with you guys. I can't even remember the year, maybe 2005 or six uh, <laughs> with, your, with your guy, John Maroon. And I told Billy, Billy, I got to, 
I got to hear the uh, F face bat story. And he goes, I'm not going to tell it to you publicly. I said, no, I'm a reporter. I need to, I need to know we got to put that out. And he said, give me a couple of years. And Billy kept his word. And, and I was at CNBC then, and we broke the internet with the, yes, I put F face on my bat. Um, and this is the story. Uh, and I know he gave uh, those cards away at a wedding. He had told me that Fleer prob- that he didn't have neat handwriting, and he accused Fleer of making the <laughs> making the writing on the bat uh, bigger. But you know, I was one of those kids running around, and his card became more more worth it than your card. He went from five cents to five hundred. Um, so, do you have any your side of that story, especially since like Billy didn't have any respectability? You're the respectable. You and your father. Are that you know your father is managing the Orioles? Uh, you're the respectable part. Did you admonish him at all for for those hijinks? No, I mean he was embarrassed enough by himself, um, <laughs> and, and a lot of people uh, um, speculated that it was a prank. Somebody else wrote it on his bat. You know, he pulled it up there. But the truth of the matter was, he used to write expressions on the end of his bat to find his bat in the uh, bat cart. And it was a back cart in the down the tunnel of Memorial Stadium. So if you just had a number on it, which most of us did, sometimes they all look the same. But if you have something written on them, Billy would come by and grab his BP bat and say, you know, here's mine. And he would start laughing and all that kind of stuff. So in some ways, the players were kind of good, glad that he got he uh, he got um, reprimanded for that, so to speak. Um, but he wrote it. And uh, I do believe. He used to write on it with thin Sharpie, like a thin black Sharpie. And he didn't have really good writing, but it's a distinctive look that he uh, uh, prints or writes. It's kind of a combination of print write. But I wonder if the, somebody caught it early on and then they, they uh, decided, hey, this might be a collectible and then let it go. Or maybe enhanced it a little bit to do it. But to tell you, he was really embarrassed about that. And uh, as uh, because it had value to it and because he is, he's got a sense of humor, he did give it out as his groomsman's gifts. Um, when he, when he- <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, kids were trampling each other for this card. This was, this was ridiculous. In fact, I bought a couple when they became, when they went down to $5 to, to keep in my office. Um, Cal, uh, you're on Twitter now at Cal Ripken Jr. Correct. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, what's, what's the latest thing going on with you that you're doing? Uh, what really got me, the impetus that got me to get on uh, Twitter, I always saw the value in it, but I always thought you had to be a little bit more extroverted or outgoing to make that work. And I was, I always thought I was introverted and uh, I like my privacy at times. But we built a wonderful foundation in my dad's name. We've done wonderful work all over the country. We have a really good infrastructure, 35, 40 people on the board. We have influence everywhere. We build fields, million dollar fields in these communities. And we built almost 100 by now. Wow. So during this time frame, we all sat around saying, you know, look, let us change our focus just temporarily to help um, the neighborhoods and the, uh, the families and the kids that need it most right now that's fighting with food insecurity. Because a lot of them rely on the Boys and Girls Club, the schools to get their uh, meals. So we turned our focus. We put our money where our mouth was. We put up 100 grand. Our uh, partners uh, gave um, equal amount of money. Let me see. Uh, Kevin Harvick Foundation jumped in really strong. Ollie's Bargain Outlet uh, jumped in really strong. Niagara Cares jumped in with a matching $250,000. So all of a sudden we had a lot of money, but I thought that um, we could uh, appeal to social media to get uh, people that just to help in a small way, because for every dollar given, um, there's it's 10 meals distributed. Um, uh, Feeding America is our expert um, partner. We, we don't know how to distribute food, but Feeding America does. And uh, they were really happy that we were getting involved. And we feel like we're doing something now uh, to really help. So there's a lot of momentum uh, going on there. And I thought it'd be a good reason to go on social media. But I've embraced it. You know, I'm kind of I'm kind of having fun with uh, with uh, little memorabilia pieces. My dog outside I can do a couple of tricks. I put them on. If, uh, if I if I if I could give you any advice as someone uh, who. You know, I'm a. I should be a boring business reporter who got to two million followers. Uh, it's just just telling cool stories or a cool picture. You know, the fact that you're on a rookie card with a guy who became a priest in Africa, that kind of <laughs> that that kind of story. You know, just weird, different things. You know, like I t- tonight on the last dance, I'm going to be doing pop up video. Um, 
you know, essentially saying that Dennis Rodman's career as a basketball player started when he stole 50 watches as a security guard in the graveyard shift at uh, Dallas Fort Worth airport. If that did not happen, he probably would have never even started playing basketball at the age of 21. I mean, huh. just a crazy, crazy story. So it, the more stories you tell, um, the more you get into it, I think people will love it. Even even going in and shooting as you're going through your collection. Yeah, um, for sure. I was going to say is that you reminded me is when I go through these pieces of memorabilia, just for my own sake and go through it, there's stories attached to it. There's a there's a dialogue that comes through. I found the other day. Um, I'm sorry if you if we uh, if we have a minute or two. I, can I got one you. more minute. I got one more minute. Yeah. Um, in 1987, when my consecutive inning streak ended, um, I couldn't sleep. I wrote down like 12 to 14 pages of my handwritten feeling notes that time. I found that the other day. And ah. I read it and I laughs. You know, it's on a legal piece of paper. But that's golden to me, which uh, tells you the feelings. And this was before, you know, this whole streak thing really happened. But there was a lot of meaning in those 14 pages. And, and so on the streak game, by the way, uh, so on that, what was it, 2-1, one, 3-1? Uh, mm -hmm. so how many pairs of whatever did you wear? Did you wear nine jerseys? Did you wear, cause at that, at that point, memorabilia was there. Was that, what, what year was that? 95. 95. Right. Yeah. So, so people were aware of it and, uh, people always like to collect, uh, the, me, um, I was an easier autograph. So it was kind of fun. I wore two jerseys that night. And the reason I did that was because I wore a shirt, T-shirt underneath that said uh, 2,131 hugs and kisses for daddy. So my kids gave me those shirts and I wanted to show my kids that I wore them during the game. So I created this sort of ceremony where I took my jersey off, gave it to my kids. But really, it was only to expose the T-shirt underneath. But I had those two jerseys uh, wore. I didn't change all the time. Um, I might have broke a bat in that game, um, although I did it a home run. So um i played well every and you time. and you hit a home and you hit a home run in your last all-star game yeah sometimes uh um you hope things turn out really well and sometimes your uh concentration kind of goes to another level when you're but uh, i felt really good about uh my how i was swinging the bat when i went into that all-star game so so i had a chance Cal Ripken Jr., 21 seasons, 2007 induction into the Hall of Fame, at Cal Ripken Jr. on Twitter. You also have a great autograph. You could read every letter. So fans <laughs> across the nation, thank you as, as players get worse and worse with that. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoy if you watch The Last Dance tonight. And uh, I'm, I'm watching for sure. I, I enjoyed it uh, last week. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Hey, thanks for your time, Cal. Yep, my pleasure. Anytime. Thank you. Man, that was a great interview. I love when people who are in the sport collect their own stuff, understand, um, you know, the importance just for themselves. They're not thinking about selling it. But if they did think about selling it, they would probably sell it to our next guests. Uh, let me, before I introduce him, just tell you we are giving away uh, a 1984-85 Chicago Bulls yearbook with Michael Jordan on the cover. Uh, follow us on Action Network HQ on Twitter um, and put hashtag MJ Raffle so we can find you and track you down and DM you. We're not trying to just say follow us. You have to follow us so we can DM you and get your address. So, Okay. Uh, George Carl, Cal Ripken Jr. Now I'm going to bring in Nat Turner, whose Jordan collection I envy. I don't feel like I'm an envious person, but I feel like there's some jealousy with some of the pieces that Nat has. Nat, how are you? I'm good, Darren. How are you? Good. Um, your collection has gone up faster than the stock market for sure over the past week. Um, but I also know that you probably don't care because you love, I mean, if you, what's your, your Instagram handle where you show all your cards? What is that? Uh, it's Nat S. Turner underscore cards. Okay, so so Nat really, when, when he puts out his cards, you know he's really enjoying them. And that means that even if the price goes up, you would have to pry it from his dirty hands um, because he really loves it. And I thank you because I love people who love instead of just try to flip. Um, but so one of the cards, the cards that the card that we got in a fight over, not a fight, but 
I don't understand. My my disconnect is I stopped collecting cards in 92. I was very angry. I thought that there was these limited editions that weren't limited editions. And I got out and I never returned. But while I got out in 96, 97, 98, they started with real false scarcity numbered. And that created something that was like where you were in at the time and then got in more. Uh, and it's the, I didn't even know this metal universe set existed. So we're going to go through and talk about some of the cards that Nat has. Talk to me about this green metal universe Jordan card. Yeah, it's a card from uh, 1997. Uh, Skybox, Fleer Skybox, they merged as a company. They, they were probably the, it was them, Upper Deck and Tops. And they were known, Skybox, as producing very kind of unique designs. Uh, their big set, I think the first one was 95, was called Metal. And they, it looked metallic. The, there was foil, um, very futurist, uh, you know, settings on the cards. And uh, they had this limited edition parallel called Precious Metal Gems, which actually started the year before in Kobe's rookie year, 96, but it wasn't serial numbered. And in 97, when uh, they started serial numbering the Precious Metal Gems, they made two versions. One was an emerald green and one was a ruby red. Uh, there were 100 total of the two, the first 10 being green and the next 90 being red. Uh, and, that's, and that's what they were. And they were actually, it was pretty interesting because they were very accessible as kids. I was 11 years old and the packs were about $2. You could buy them at Target, Walmart, um, you know, card shows. And the precious metal gems were only inserted in the hobby packs, which you could only get at card shops or, or card shows. Uh, but it was still, there were only two or three bucks. It was very hard to pull one though. The, the parallels were, you know. And were, isn't, there, isn't there some story, and this is obviously very important in modern day cards where grading comes in, because, is, doesn't it have something that the way it was like metallic, it was hard to get like a 10, a gem mint. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know of a gem mint, uh, precious, the PSA. Okay. Yeah. They so what you have is this green, what, what you got is this green uh, metal universe Jordan so there's that means there's 10 of them but yeah. yours is the best condition i think no mine's actually not uh mine's graded it's actually technically mine's altered but it, it was trimmed slightly I, I can't really tell it doesn't matter actually the grade when you have 10 of something in a card you know like a jordan rookie where there's thousands of them the grade really does matter but when there's 10 of something just owning the card itself and i put this on my instagram is way more important than what the grade is um, but I don't think uh, the other nine have been have received a numeric grade. In fact, uh, I only know. Is it more. possible they don't even? Is it possible they they like are in a garbage can and don't yeah. even exist physically? I, so I was about to say I know where six of the ten are. <laughs> See, this is what I love about. That. <laughs> and, but here's the, here's the kicker: one one guy I know owns four of them. Uh, I know where one other is, and then I have one. So, okay, let's go on to. The Kobe Jordan logo man. Also, again, I love memorabilia. I think about it every single day. And I don't get how it's the cut up pieces of the logo man, the Jerry West logo on their jerseys. And like this card costs more. You could buy three Michael Jordan game used jerseys and three Kobe game used jerseys. And you still would have money left over. Uh, to to do whatever you i mean this card is is ridiculous what is the obsession explain to me what's the obsession with the logo mans is it again yeah. very scarce yeah i mean so there's three so in 2003 that was lebron's rookie year which is important it also happened to be this the first year upper deck released their set called exquisite collection which is the craziest set ever produced it was like 500 dollars a pack pack yeah 2003 and it I came mean, with one and it came with one card, right? No, it came with um four or five cards. Okay. I actually never opened a pack, <laughs> by the way. But it came out, they still produce it. Um, it's different now because the upper deck doesn't have an NBA license anymore. But when it came out, it was the rage, and it coincided with LeBron's rookie year. And look every since 97, they had a jersey, like a cutout card upper deck did with a piece of jersey on it. But never before had they singled out the NBA logo. And, you know, you think about it, there's only one NBA logo on a jersey. So technically speaking, it's 
not only a rare card, but it's the only right logo from the player's jersey. And it was really unique. It was the first time they put two players on the same card uh, with a logo man as well. So it was all these firsts, you know, LeBron, Exquisite, Logo Man's Duel, uh, two players in the same card, et cetera, et cetera. But there were three of them. There was an MJ Kobe, an MJ LeBron, and a Kobe LeBron. And all of them have sold or been valued at like, what, like three hundred, four hundred thousand, like tremendous amount of money. Uh, well, the MJ LeBron was nine hundred thousand. Nine hundred. That's that's the that was the record for the modern day card, right? Yeah, and then the. Yeah, the other two I actually own as well, and they were they were below that, but significant. Yeah, right. Uh, okay, then I have this card, which is the MJ All Star cutout uh, with a beautiful signature on it. Now, again, Michael Jordan signed a million times, even for Upper Deck. Uh, what makes this great? I mean, it's a, it's an iconic. It's one of my favorite yeah. All Star Game jerseys. Um, but but what makes this one great? Yeah, this this card is like probably my favorite from the 90s. So in 97, they came out with the first game used jersey set. And there were 24 players in it, like Marcus Canby, like Gary, you know, like, <laughs> like, you know, like some some you know lower name people. But then they had Jordan and they had all there were one in two thousand five hundred packs. That was the insert odds of the non-autograph. Like I pulled an Antoine Walker, by the way, once and a Penny Hardaway. This was like in the last few years. Um, and I felt like I hit the you know jackpot because I beat the odds. The Jordan one, though. They How had, hey, well, hold on, hold, hold, hold. How many packs did you open up? So here's the thing. I opened three boxes, 24 packs, actually 36 packs each. So I beat the odds tremendously. I pulled one, a, a jersey in each of the first two boxes. And I said, I should try my luck again. And I got nothing, so. But um, you, they're very thick cards, and they have rounded corners. So when you open a pack, you can actually tell the second you're holding the pack that there's something in it. And people used uh, to now, that. now, are you in your house? Do you scream? Do you wake up the baby? Do you, you know? Now, do you... <laughs> when I pulled the Penny Hardaway, like, that was a real pull. Uh, he had two cards in that set, one with a blue jersey, one with a white. I pulled the one with the blue, and it had a white stripe through it, which is pretty cool. That's why the Jordan that I, that I sent you a photo of is so unique. It's, most of them were white patches. That one actually has a piece of, of blue and other colors in the patch. But the point I was going to make is Upper Deck had the foresight to have Michael Jordan sign only 23 copies of the game-used jersey. He had many of the game-used jersey cards non-autographed in that set, but only 23 autographed. Um, and it's just so cool because it was the first year they had the jersey, and it was the first ever signed jersey card, and they coincide in the same year. Um, so let, let, let me ask you this question, and we could put up the Fleer, the rookie, and – um, you own a 10, obviously, and you have a, 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 does the pack, do you have a pack with a Jordan on the back? Uh, I have one with the sticker on the back. I don't oh, have with the Jordan sticker on the back. Okay. So people are listening to the show. They say, damn, you know, the show's making me want to collect Michael Jordan memorabilia. And we've seen the prices skyrocket like crazy. Um, to someone who's getting into it, obviously there's different price ranges, but what is your advice on getting in? Do you try to get a unique piece? Um, like, you know, I have the him writing the phone number to Charlie Sheen. Um, try to find something unique. Do you try to get a, a Jordan rookie? How do you, what, where do you think the greatest percentage jump is? You know, how, how do you, the general person, how do you, how do you figure out um, how to advise someone to get into Michael Jordan. Yeah. I mean, I always say, start with what you like. Um, as you said before, I mean, value is not my number one goal with cards. It just, if you collect really good players like Michael Jordan, you will probably make money if that's your goal. Um, but I, that's for me, secondary, secondary goal. but I mean, you know, as far as, as common cards, again, start with what you like. You can't go wrong with rookie cards of any player. You can't go wrong with scarcity. So buy things that are serial numbered or autographed or have jerseys on them. And definitely PSA as far as counterfeit goes. There's got to be, that has to be the 86, 87 Jordan has to be the most counterfeited card yeah. now. Well, I've heard a lot about that. I, you know, I haven't seen a counterfeit card in the 86 Fleer. I, I'm sure it's possible. I always say buy graded no matter what. I don't care if it's 86 or a 99 card. I mean, you, you want to know counterfeit, obviously, but you really want to know the condition of the card. I mean, there could be dinged corners or scratched surfaces or things that you just can't tell 
you know, on an eBay listing and having it graded just gives you a whole different level of trust that the card is what it is. Uh, and that's really, I mean, when you go on eBay, I mean, I don't know, 95% of cards now are graded. Um, so last question is the market that's going on now with the MJ rookie real or a bubble? I mean, it's amazing that it's happening at the time it's happening in this country where like people have 30% less cash automatically. And, but I guess the world is the world and there's people in China and there's people, and that's, that's why people are competing with other people. But is this a real market or is it, uh, there's just so many eights, nines and tens that for now people are just going to say, I just got to have it now and I'll pay whatever it takes. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm on eBay, like, you know, a couple hours a day. <laughs> and I, and I've, I've been tracking this for like years and I, you know, PSA 10, Michael Jordan rookies, Fleer were, they went up to like 35 grand a couple years ago, which was like three times what they were a month prior. They, and, they did, which was, which was interesting that I thought at the Chicago national that they would be like 40, right? Cause it's in Chicago and, and it yeah. actually went, it went down. They were selling them from 15 to 18. Right. I think because of China alone, there were, or Asia, there was somehow some, they were, weren't buying them in the same capacity, but yeah, continue. Well, no, I was just going to say they went down and, you know, for a player like him or LeBron, like that doesn't happen that often. People, I don't think realize how many 86 Fleer cards there are. There were a lot, that was a pretty widely produced set. Uh, there's a lot of boxes still out there, unopened boxes that people are buying for fifty, sixty thousand dollars and opening them. And each one has three or four Jordan rookies in it. On average, I've heard I haven't opened one, but um, you know, it, it, there's the supply. It's all economic supply demand. You know, if you look on eBay right now, there's no PSA 10 available. Uh, Ken Golden has one on his website, his auction, but like that's it. I mean, like so, if you're watching the Last Dance right now and you have some spare cash and you're thinking about putting it in gold. Or, you know, and Michael Jordan rookie card, which, by the way, some people think are similar alternative assets. You, you have one option right now. So <laughs> <laughs> I know and that's already at a record. That's already at 57 yeah. grand. So I think what happens is these things catch up. And so people are going to see that price that they're going to say, hey, I, you know, maybe it's now time I sell mine or get mine graded or whatever. And it'll take time to catch up. It's not like the stock market where these things, you know, update every hour. In, in Jordan rookie card land, it's, you know, on a monthly or, or quarterly uh, basis. But I think, you know, there's a lot of buyers. There's people my age who are starting to make real money in their jobs or whatever it is. And they're saying, hey, I really wanted that card as a kid. And, you know, I, I'm going to buy it and keep it forever. And so that card never gets resold on eBay. But and as I as I said before, the, the greatest part of this story is none of us wanted it as a kid. Like we yeah. loved Michael Jordan. I went to every Knicks, Bulls, Nets, Bulls game I could go to. I was obsessed with him. But baseball cards were baseball cards. And, you know, this is this is a 1986 baseball pack. I did this the last show, but if you didn't see it the last show, this cost 50 cents. 1986 Fleer basketball cost 50 cents. We bought these, okay? Yeah. This is now $2, and a pack of 86 Fleer basketball is $2,000. So we missed... And I mean, you couldn't even sell these things back then. That that's what's so crazy. Um, Matt, it's about Michael, right. Though, right? The year before that thing's worthless. So, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, Nat, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, I hope that we could open packs in person together and not over Zoom for the rest of time. Uh, <laughs> so uh, stay healthy and have fun watching the show tonight. Uh, and then the next show is Nike, which is my kind of thing. But uh, but thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Darren. All right. Well, uh, a year ago, I had lunch with this man coming up and Dennis Rodman uh, at a local diner. And uh, Dennis is a very interesting guy, which means that in order to manage him, you have to be an interesting guy. Um, so Darren Prince has uh, managed Dennis Rodman, the marketing of Dennis Rodman for 21 years. Uh, and I can bet that Mr. Rodman has gotten many interesting proposals, including one that he accepted, which is to go to North Korea, uh, to Kim Jong-un, um, which uh, was probably one of the most intriguing things a player has ever done. Uh, we definitely want to hear that story from Darren. 
Um, and the profile on Rodman tonight as part of the third piece in this last dance is going to be tremendous because Dennis Rodman's story is perhaps the most ridiculous story of any NBA player to make it to his level. Uh, did not play basketball, a single high school basketball game, um, and then went to a community college and then went to Southeastern Oklahoma State and led the, led the NAIA in pretty much everything uh, and became the player that he did. So joining us now is Darren Prince. Darren, how are you? What's up, my man? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, I know that this Rodman piece is coming up and uh, his story is just insanity. Um, you know, that he, if he maybe didn't steal the watches at the Dallas Fort Worth airport and someone doesn't, wherever he went, Cook County, whatever, whatever, whatever that junior college was. And then he completely rips up the NAIA to get drafted by the Pistons in 86. Um, but but the the most interesting part of Dennis Rodman is being who he is and being the person that he wants to be, which was one of one of the main themes of his book, As Bad As I Want to Be. So mm -hmm. tell me how you met Dennis and uh, how you begin to get close to a guy who is very difficult to get close to because he he's interested in him himself. He, he, he wants to do what he wants to do. Right. So the standard, like, Hey, I'm a marketing agent. Like, let me take care of you. Let me get you endorsement deals does not work with him. So how no. did you guys meet and how did it happen? I met him right after he made the two free throws in 1996 against Seattle game two, the NBA finals, uh, where George Carl said that uh, he should have MVP that series. <laughs> I agree, but we knew there was no way it was going to happen. And I met him on the court. And the amazing thing about it was I talked business for like, I don't know, 30, 45 seconds. A friend of mine introduced me to him and Dwight Manley, his agent, then and knew I represented Magic Johnson and uh, Pamela Anderson, a bunch of people. He's like, that's like waving off. All right, do whatever. He goes, why don't you come meet us at Crazy Horse tonight? We're going to have a crazy <laughs> freaking night. So all he wanted me to do was go to Crazy Horse with him, which was an insane strip club in Chicago at the time. And George Trentafella was a longtime bodyguard, uh, made sure I was cool. And um, yeah, it was a heck of a night. So we broke bread at a strip club. That, that That's amazing. And although it was uh, 20... Four years ago, you 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 still remember it. Uh, what are some of the the wacky endorsement deals that I know Dennis has accepted a, a bunch of them? Uh, but mm -hmm. what are some of the wacky endorsement deals that he's been offered over time that either you turned down or you said yes to? The ones that we said yes to was probably um, there was a company in Joy RX, which was a male and female sexual enhancement product, and <laughs> we fucked him on Jay Leno to promote it, and it was a taffy chew, and he put it right on Jay's desk and. Did Jay to a couple right now. So it was just a perfect, like, fun type of project for Dennis to have fun with. And um, I mean, I think after North Korea, the wonderful pistachio commercial um, was hilarious when we were on set where they had a Kim Jong un look alike. And okay, uh, I'm stopping you right there because I'm not going to run out of time. I got nine minutes in this show. Okay. Okay. I need, you, you can go for as much as four minutes here. I need how the hell number 91 for the Bulls becomes the closest United States ambassador and has more substantive meetings with a government than anyone else in the United States. How uh, did I, this happen? I, I think I can do it in three minutes. So okay. Shane, Smith, Shane Smith calls me and his executive producer maybe back in 2012 uh, from Vice Media. And they told me that's this opportunity for Dennis to go with the Harlem Group uh, Trotters to North Korea. It's actually comical. I talked about it on Venice's 30 for 30. And the trip got canceled, bro, like six times. I couldn't figure out why. Clearance issues, that they, they, they couldn't get the filming right. You couldn't figure out why I'm a like, North Korean trip was canceled? You got, you got to let me finish because let me tell you, there's a lot of people listening right now. If they're honest, they're going to understand where I'm coming from. So at the time, Sai was like the biggest thing in the world. I really did not understand the difference between North and South. So Steve Simon in my office, you know, that's been my boy since I was 10. I finally get the contract on it, go downstairs, all excited. I go, bro, I got the deal done finally for Dennis to go to North Korea. And he looks at me, he's like, 
you mean South Korea? I was like, yeah, whatever. I was like, we got to figure out who size agent is the gangman style. It'd be pretty cool PR hit for Dennis to meet up with them. He goes, let me see the contract. And he looks, he goes, you freaking idiot. He's going to Pongyang, North Korea. He goes, he can't go there. He goes, he'll be killed. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he pulls up the internet and I read the Hermit Kingdom. I read all about Kim Jong-un. I was like, oh man, to Dennis's credit, I called him up. He's like, bro, I'll go. He's like, fuck it. He goes, man, if I can do something historic and get President Obama and him to get together, he goes, this would be a pretty cool opportunity. Just make sure my black ass is safe. That's what he told me. Now, and, now, um, is, it wasn't wasn't it that Kim Jong Un like maybe wanted Jordan and Pippin first because he was a Bulls fan or something crazy like Jordan, that? Jordan was never asked. Pippin was asked, um, but he also was in boarding school. He was a huge Rodman fan. So when Shane came to me, he showed me pictures of him wearing a '91 jersey. And then the trip, the first trip was so successful, we hooked up with one of the foremost um, historians of uh, North Korean culture, Professor Joseph Turwinger in New York City, and my boy Chris Volo, Vo Volo. And then they just crushed it from an hour on out. They've taken five trips since and, and, and built some incredible relationships out there. What does Dennis Rodman say to them? I mean, right? Like he's a man of few words to begin with, and then they have a language barrier, and then they have like extreme communism. <laughs> He said they were talking a lot of basketball. That was it. He talked about Michael. He talked about LeBron. He talked about Kobe. Um, and then they talked about life. Um, you know, he met, he met his daughter, I believe. It was like a baby at the time. And they partied. Uh, they went to, an, uh, I guess, one of his retreats. And they went jet skiing. And um, apparently they had this amazing time. I saw the photos when I got back. I couldn't believe it. And when he says he's got a friend for life, what people don't understand is he never made it political. It's always about a friendship, a trusting relationship between two people. So it was hard for him to hear all the criticism when he got back because he knew Kim Jong-un wanted to change the system out there because he told him that. His translators told him that. And, um, you know, Dennis is an authentic guy. You know, he wears his heart on his sleeve and it really bothered him. He, he got beat up for a long time until I think Trump eventually, you know, got with him in Singapore, which Dennis was at, which Sarah Saunders called Dennis, and this was on Vice, and thanked him for his assistance with everything that, you know, has made this opportunity happen for the president to meet Kim Jong-un. He is um, the, probably one of the most unique people that I've ever met. Um, he's, he's crazy on the outside and reserved on the inside. So just, just tell people who don't know him, because you know him as best as anyone, what he's like as a person. You know, he's got, a, he's got a great heart, you know, but he struggles with a lot of demons. You know, he's very open about his alcoholism and his struggles with alcohol. And um, look, you know, you know, I'm, you know, I'm in recovery for 12 years for an opiate addiction. And, you know, and, that's got and that's probably why you guys, I mean, it's, it's so easy for you guys to kind of be together. Yeah, you know, but, you know, I, I give them credit because there's been some real good periods of sobriety. But at the end of the day, it's, it's no matter what issues we all have, it's about getting inside, getting into that core and figuring out whether it's the abandonment from his dad, his mom, whatever it might be. But, you know, when we did Lewis House's podcast, Lewis brought up such a great point to me because, Dennis, do you realize if your mother did not kick you out, everything that happened the way that it did, you wouldn't be the Dennis Robin you are today? So I try reminding him of that because that's what motivated him to get off his ass. So instead of holding on to certain resentments or abandonment issues, you know, accept it. You know, you're 58 years old and you know, he's got his he's got his great days and he's got days that are a little bit of a struggle. But I know he's really enjoying this time at the last dance. And tonight, the whole first episode's about him. Carmen Electra is a client. She's excited to see herself tonight. And um, I, I know it's going to be a special Dennis Rodman uh, first episode on the last dance. I went to a UFC press conference in 2000 when Dana White and the Fertitas bought the UFC only because Carmen Electra was promised to be there. And I showed up to the ESPN <laughs> zone. And as always, she delivered in a one piece blue suit with the zipper down to here. Of course. Uh, and and, and, and I, I'm like, if the UFC never makes it, it probably won't. You know, I'm glad I'm glad I drove down from Bristol, Connecticut to uh, to see Carmen Electra. You were busy uh, looking at her instead of thinking about how you can invest in the U USC, right? Big Darren, uh, Prince Marketing Group, 21 years, Dennis Rodman. Uh, just give a quick plug to your book and people can find you on Instagram and Facebook. 
Uh, yeah, my book is Aiming High. It's about my journey through the hell of addiction to the beauty of spiritual recovery and all, you know, my business ups and downs being an agent to so many icons and at agent underscore <laughs> DJ. That's Darren, th th thank you so much for joining. Have fun tonight. We love the 30 for 30 on Rodman. And uh, watch my uh, Twitter feed. Um, no, I know you're not a Twitter guy, really, but like I got some special Rodman stuff that even you might say, "Wow, awesome, bro!" <laughs> All right, thanks. You. Love you. Take we'll care. Catch up when I'm back east. You got okay. it. Okay, you got it. Thanks. All right, so what a, a great show! Uh, George Carl, Cal Ripken Jr., Nat Turner, uh, Darren Prince, um, and we also gave away a 1984-85 Bulls yearbook is it preston rules is that what i saw across the screen what was what what's the guy's twitter handle uh it is preston rules 19 so congratulations i assume your name is preston i'm not gonna say that it's rules uh but uh you guys get ready it's 8 58 we got two minutes i gotta get my twitter feed ready hope you enjoyed this uh we will be doing this every week uh heading up to uh, the last dance. Um, and so next week it will be Nike. So we'll focus a little on Nike. We'll try to get some icons with Nike, um, and talk a little bit more about Jordan memorabilia. I am the action networks, Darren Ravel, follow us on action network HQ, both on every single platform, uh, including Twitch and, uh, enjoy the show tonight. Good night, everyone.